This video is sponsored by Real Vision. Check out this chart of Deutsche Bank. As you can tell, no one can actually figure out what the price should be. For a while there, it looked like it was going to zero. But now in the past month, the stock has rallied some 25%. But I mean, the long-term chart does not look great. So what's going on here? Could there be a case for buying European banks at this point? Well, that's exactly what we're gonna talk about on this week's episode of Real Visions, The One Thing. What's going on investors, AK here. So last week Real Vision took a look at the European banking system. And there's a lot to talk about here considering the slow moving European politics, the ECB's not so effective monetary policy, and then of course the fractured banking system. Now I've already mentioned Deutsche Bank's share price, but that's not the whole story. Because most of these banks' debt far outweigh their market cap. So Deutsche Bank, for example, has almost 16.5 billion worth of equity compared to 611 billion worth of debt. Let's start with Thomas Meyer explaining what the core problem is. First of all, we have a sluggish economic performance. Compare the US growth to the European growth, we are less dynamic. That's always a problem. Secondly, we have a fragmented banking market. Um, the idea initially was, once we created the euro, your, your, your area banking market would consolidate. It right. hasn't. There are too many banks around. We have seen very little, hardly any cross-border consolidation. So they're basically eating each other up. Third point. Um, we have already for years here in Germany a very flat yield curve. The banks rely on what they call their interest rate margin. I call it um, seniorage for money creation. So you basically issue a credit, charge the creditor and put it on deposit and don't give any interest to the depositor. Right. The banks call it interest margin. If your yield curve is flat, Gone. All right, so slow growth combined with a fractured banking system and a flat yield curve. And it's all in the context of a low equity flow versus debt, which makes a company's share price way more volatile. So what are you supposed to do as an investor? Could these possibly be value plays at this point? Well, Whitney Tillerson, a value investor and former hedge fund manager, had this to say. Well, generally, um, banks, particularly investment banks, which have big derivative books, um, because uh, I think you have to differentiate between, you know, just your standard retail banking franchises um, versus investment banks like a Deutsche Bank or mm -hmm. something. Generally speaking, they make me nervous. Insurance companies I'd throw in there as well in that there's just uh, there's black swan risk out there because there's leverage and because um, they have big either derivative books or loan books where it's very difficult often. They're sort of black boxes, so you right. don't know what's in there. So you just have to have a lot of confidence in management uh, generally, which is why you know Berkshire Hathaway certainly uh, is something I felt comfortable owning just because I've studied Buffett and Munger so closely and understand their fundamental conservatism. Uh, but there aren't very many other financials. Uh, I mean, the financial sector, the history of financials is just littered with boom and busts and management teams that are out there trying to deliver steady earnings growth in a sector that often doesn't lend itself to that. Okay, so an American investor is scared of the big risks of Deutsche Bank's balance sheet, especially in an industry where it's difficult to deliver steady earnings growth. Tilson doesn't think the risk is worth the reward. But what do European investors think? Well, here's Philip Fondron with his opinion. Why is it that you've decided to take a hard pass on the banking sector? Yeah, the decision was uh, taken in 2007 when the first um, real information that the mortgage crisis could be more relevant appeared to us. We looked into uh, some of the German banks uh, and uh, realized there are some special purpose vehicles. Nobody could give us uh, clear information what the value of them was. But the risk involved was uh, we had the feeling the, the CFOs of the banks had no clue about what was going on. And then we made a very easy decision. If we don't understand the corporation, if we don't have a sound feeling for the quality and the profitability of a business model, then we can't justify investments like that to our clients. So a successful German investment firm has stayed far away from these European banks because they don't think management actually understands the deep problems that they're in. But it doesn't just stop at management problems. Simon White from Variant Perception explains that a secular change in interest rates or inflation expectations could destroy the whole industry. I think banks are going to struggle because of this um, 
you know, tail risks essentially shifting because in the last 30 or 40 years, you could basically be reliant on the fact that although rates might go higher, the general trend was, was lower. We just had a series of lower lows. Um, in an environment where the tail risks shift to higher inflation, the risk is always going to be we're going to have bursts higher in shorter term rates. And that, I think, makes the bank business model extremely difficult because not only is it difficult for them, as I say, they're borrowing uh, shorter term uh, uh, assets, essentially they're borrowing in a shorter term period and lending longer term, they also have, they provide leverage to other people. And if there's less demand for leverage, they're really unable to provide that in the same way that they would like to. So the whole kind of last 30 or 40 years, if you like, the, the dominating times of banking is kind of, will, will be very difficult under those circumstances. So it's really about, not about what instantly happens. As I say, I don't think you'd instantly get higher inflation or instantly see uh, shorter term rates rise, but the kind of risk profile will change and it will really challenge that business model. So White sees some existential threats on the horizon for the European banks. Whether you believe him or Fondron, Europe is in for an interesting future. Andreas Steno sums it up by explaining how the ECB is in between a rock and a hard place with the banks and exporters. He says that the ECB may have to choose one to save, but in doing that, they're probably gonna have to let the other one fail. So the ECB has a choice, but what's really the end game here? Well, Andreas has an idea for that and how to play it too. It could be an issue for European banks, but I would expect European banks to struggle more due to the flat yield curve in Europe, basically. And I would have uh, said after the ECB meeting yesterday that it was a success if they managed to steepen the yield curve. They did not. Actually, the opposite happened. They flattened it due to a very, very poorly designed tiering system, in my view. So actually, they only uh, did matters worse for the European banks. Uh, the struggles will continue, in my view, given that the yield curve uh, did nothing but flattening yesterday. And the tiering, what was the tiering that they announced, or how is, how is that going to work for these banks? Well, they announced a, um, an exemption for all banks in the Eurozone, six times their marginal reserve requirement. Um, so that's basically the buffer that a bank needs to hold at the ECB. Uh, so six times that amount will be exempted from the negative deposit rate at the ECB. The issue is that all of the deposits, they are parked in German, French, Dutch and fin Finnish banks. So when Italian banks are exempted at six times their marginal reserve requirements, they basically uh, allow the Italian banks to place all of their excess liquidity at zero uh, at the ECB because they don't have a lot of, uh, of excess liquidity. And that could lead to a spike in repo rates in Southern Europe. Uh, so maybe there is actually a, a risk of an unintentional tightening of financial conditions in Southern Europe due to this tiering system. One size doesn't fit all. My base case is that we will get a rebound in the global economy by April uh, next year. So before that, we are going south still. And I have a base case of a sell-off in equity markets in Q4. For some reason, it's always in Q4. And I think the withdrawal of dollar liquidity due to the uh, US Treasury uh, building up its cash buffer again will be the trigger of that sell-off. So a dollar liquidity removal will be bad news for risk appetite in general. So therefore, my base case is just to, to, to just stay long uh, safe haven assets for the next four or five months. And then that could be the trigger of that soft QE4. Maybe it's too early to expect it by late this year, but maybe in Q1 next year, after we've seen this risk-off environment, then the Fed could inject liquidity again and maybe we are back to hallelujah, at least for, for some time being. So he thinks that we're in for an equity sell-off in Q4 because of a dollar squeeze. And then the central banks will respond with more easing, which will send equities higher once again. So over the next six months, he sees safe haven assets like treasuries or precious metals outperforming. But as soon as the central banks start QE up again, it should be time to get back into equity. Whichever way you wanna play it, make sure you hang out with us at Real Vision. I'll talk to you next week. Thank you.